Well, welcome, everybody. How's everybody doing? It's so great to be back after two weeks in the woods where I grew a beard. Uh, we did vote on Wednesday night whether I should keep it, so I'm keeping it for now. Uh, by the way, if we haven't met, my name is Steve, and I'm the lead pastor here at Lifeway Church. Um, Thank you so much to God be all the glory, and I'm so excited that you're here as we are continuing our message series called Journey to the Empty Tomb. Uh, today we are celebrating with literally billions of our brothers and sisters in Christ, Palm Sunday, all across the planet. Isn't that powerful? That's so powerful. The first Palm Sunday happened in the spring, early spring of AD 33, when Jesus of Nazareth rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, signaling the final days of his earthly ministry and his decisive act to declare that God's kingdom reality had begun. In this series, we have been taking a journey through the story that leads to the most important event of human history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, back when, uh, I don't know if Tina's still in the sanctuary. I think she walked out. When, back when Tina and I uh, first got married, uh, I really wanted her to experience America. I asked myself, you know, what unique, uniquely American things did Tina miss growing up in Canada? The first thing I thought of were Cool Ranch Doritos. Okay? <laughs> so I made sure we were stocked up. And then the next thing I could think of was spray cheese, okay? In America, not only do we have cheese-like substances in metal cans, okay? We have four different flavors, all right? We have American, right? We got cheddar, sharp cheddar. What else? Oh, and then, of course, bacon and cheddar, right? Now, you know, that may also be why we have overweight suburban dads wearing socks with sandals, but you see, these uniquely American experiences are not that impressive, right? Okay, so I had to think of something a lot more impressive for my wife, and behold, I thought of the 4th of July, right? The day that we said no to British tyranny, you know, while Canadians still have British royalty on their money, right? So I will take her to the 4th of July Riverfront Fest in Hartford. We're only married like one week, okay? And this, this is a uniquely American experience. The food, the music, the tug-of-war contest across the river between Hartford and East Hartford. Do they still do that, by the way? See, everybody, I am so old, okay? But they did used to do that, okay? Um, and, of course, the capstone of the evening, the amazing fireworks reflecting off of the Connecticut River, where I am sure to steal an epic kiss from my beautiful bride. Now, as I expected in awe there, I got nothing. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> as newlyweds, I really wanted this to go well. So I prepared. In fact, I put aside some money for the overpriced vendors, okay? And the nerd engineer side of me, you know, had the schedule all figured out so we could maximize our fun, okay? But the most important preparation was I spent the day getting my 1980 Suzuki GS motorcycle running so that we could beat the traffic the moment the fireworks were done. Can I get an amen? amen? All right? Because getting stuck in that nightmare traffic is literally the worst part about the fireworks. So I had my escape plan figured out. And the moment it ended, we hopped on my bike. We breezed through downtown. All my preparations were flawless until... I'm riding, we're riding up Francis Street in New Britain, one turn from our apartment, okay? And now if you know Francis Street, it is super steep, okay? And now my Suzuki is light and powerful, so we zip up that street, no problem until the car in front of us decides to stop inexplicably in, at the steepest point. I can't go around because of ongoing traffic, so I stop. And of course, the moment our body weight shifts back on the bike... I pull an epic wheelie, okay, which would have been super cool, except when you pull a wheelie when you're not moving, do you know what happens? You fall, okay, and so we dump the bike, and we both end up sprawled out on the street, 
And thank God the only thing that was hurt was my ego. We can laugh at that now. But th that big day, it wasn't just a big day for me. It was the day that led up to those moments, right? The, the days that lead up to it. I can remember that sense of anticipation as I was making preparations for our big 4th of July date. Because here's the thing. Sometimes preparations can be just as significant as the moment, right? How many of you ever experienced that, right? Okay, it's kind of like Christmas, right? The days maybe leading up to Christmas where you find a perfect gift or you're decorating or preparing special food. All the preparations can be just as meaningful as the moment itself. And how many, I think some of you, how many can relate to that, right? Well, as we continue our journey to the empty tomb, we need to remember that everything that Jesus did uh, in his final week on earth is pregnant with purpose and meaning. And right in the middle of, 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 his, of Holy Week was preparations for the biggest Jewish holiday. Do you guys know what it was? Passover. It's the Passover, right? The Passover is like Christmas and New Year's and Fourth of July all combined together. In fact, it's actually three different festivals that are all put together in one week. So it's the time. In fact, Passover is actually the Jewish Independence Day. Okay, because they're celebrating, they're commemorating God's deliverance of his people out of slavery in Egypt. And it's the time to retell that story. The story of the Exodus when Moses confronted Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And Pharaoh refuses. So then Pharaoh sends plagues, if you know the story. But Pharaoh still refuses. And then finally God says, I'll send a final plague. And he's gonna say, he said that all the firstborn will die unless they have a special dinner party involving a lamb. And they sprinkle the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. It is called Passover because the angel of death would pass over the house that was marked with blood. This is the celebration that Jesus asked his disciples to prepare for in Luke chapter 22. If you're in your Bibles, you can turn there now. It'll be up on the screen. It'll also be in your worship guide. We're going to start at verse 7. Luke 22. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. Verse 13, they left and found things just as Jesus told them. So they prepared the Passover. Now, when I was reading this passage this week, my question was, why are we given all these details? I mean, think about it. Why don't we just skip to the main event? What's the main event? It's the Last Supper, right? They're preparing here for the Last Supper, but for some reason, we get to see all these details because I believe that, that God wants us to take notice of the preparations. About, because Jesus is about to take these ancient symbols and give them new meaning. A new Passover, as Jesus is a new Moses. Think about it. Moses and Jesus came up out of Egypt. And like Moses passing through the waters of the Red Sea, Jesus passes through the waters of the Jordan at his baptism. Moses is in the wilderness for 40 years. Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days. Moses receives God instruction, God's instructions on a mountain right? Jesus gives God's instruction on a mountain. In the gospel of Matthew, we see this clearly where his teachings actually organized in five sections, creating a parallel with the five books of Moses, presenting Jesus as a greater than Moses figure who will fulfill the storyline of the Torah and deliver his people from the slavery to sin. And that brings me to our big idea for today. If you're taking notes uh, here it is. As we begin Holy Week, let's prepare. Let's prepare for the promise of the empty tomb. What is the promise? It's the promise of victory over sin and death. We just sang about it, right? It's a way, it's the promise for you and I to be in right relationship with God through Jesus' life, death, 
and a resurrection. And through that, God gives us many other promises. He promises to rescue you from bondage. He promises to deliver you from whatever holds you back from his plan. He promises to help you discover the purpose for your life. And he promises to make you part of a family that is gonna make a difference in this world. So let's prepare for these promises. In fact, in, in, in eight verses, four times we see the word prepare uh, in the Greek it's hetoimatso, okay, but it means to prepare, but metaphorically, it comes from the ancient Near Eastern practice of sending out people before a king to prepare the roads to be passable, okay? So this is the word picture that we have when we are to prepare. That's what we are doing. We are preparing ourselves and others to experience King Jesus in their life. How do we do this? On our journey to the empty tomb, how do we prepare? That brings me to our next fill-in. If you're taking notes, here it is. Prepare practically in his church. Prepare practically in his church. Remember, the church is not a building. It's the assembling of God's people together. So whether we're in a church building or in the upper room or at a Dunkin' Donuts, right? We are to serve in practical ways to prepare for the assembling of God's people. Back to verse 8. Jesus sent to Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. In other words, there's some work to be done, right? Jesus was saying, was staying, by the way, in, in nearby Bethany, but the Passover meal needed to be celebrated within the city limits. And Jesus' instructions, I love it, it kind of sounds a little bit like a mission briefing for the CIA. Okay, go back to the scripture up there. It says, as you enter the city, a man carrying a, a, a jar of water will meet you. You don't say anything to him, right? Follow him to the house that he enters. You see, it was custom for a woman to carry water, so a man doing this would have been unusual. And I believe that this was a prearranged signal by Jesus, that he told the owner to send a man's servant instead of a woman at a particular time of day so he would stand out. You see, Jesus knew that the authorities were out to get him. And not only that, he knew that he had a betrayer within his own midst. Meanwhile, he had a mission. And that mission required one last Passover meal with his disciples before he's crucified. So he sends two from his inner circle. Do you see that? To his secret rendezvous. With code words, the teacher asks, doesn't use Jesus' name. The teacher asks, where is the guest room? A powerful, powerful principle emerges here that God is the one who makes arrangements, but he asks us to do the preparing. God is the one who makes arrangements, but he asks us to do the preparing. Now, it was the better houses that had upper rooms. Verse 12 tells us that he will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. So this is a big room with tables, chairs, couches, carpets, tapestries. The owner was probably a wealthy disciple or friend of Jesus who was willing to lend his well-equipped space for ministry. By the way, many Bible scholars believe this is the same room that the disciples continued to meet in after, right? We know that the disciples continued to gather. There were some of the resurrection appearances there, the election of Matthias as an apostle to replace Judas, and the place where the church was born when the Holy Spirit came upon them in the day at Pentecost. You see, here's the thing. The powerful principle is someone's practical gift provided the headquarters for the early church. Do you see that? And after they secured this place, they needed to gather the Passover meal. What did that include? We know that a lamb, right? They needed unleavened bread, a bowl of salt water. They collected bitter herbs, which was a mixture of horseradish, chicory, um, endive, and lettuce. They needed paste that was made from apples, dates, pomegranates, and nuts. And they needed wine mixed with water, along with four different cups that would be used at four different stages throughout the meal. And in a moment, we're going to look at the spiritual significance of each of those elements that I just gave you. But know that every detail spoke about the great deliverance from Egypt. And now Jesus is going to pour new meaning into these ancient symbols. He's going to provide a spiritual download that's going to blow their mind at the Last Supper. And it's not only going to change their lives, but it's going to change the lives of every Christian who has participated in communion since. 
But there, for this profound spiritual moment to happen, we needed practical preparation. You see that? It couldn't happen without the time and the effort and the expense that was taken. And we are still called to do that today, to do whatever practical things are needed to make a way for ourselves and others to encounter the living God. Perhaps it may be opening up your home to host a life group. Or maybe simply it's just giving someone a ride to church. But in order for that to happen, you might need, like to, need to do some practical things. Like you need, might need to clean your house, right? Or you might need to wake up earlier on Sunday morning or maybe fix your motorcycle to give them a ride to church that they will never forget. <laughs> Each week, our dream team does this as they prepare for people to experience God by setting up our kids' church, preparing music, videos, messages, floors are vacuumed, plumbing is fixed, hopefully, the trash is taken out, greeters arrive early, and the hospitality team makes coffee. Can I get an amen? amen? They're all doing the practical work of ministry so that people can have a place to gather and a place to encounter God. First Peter chapter 4 says this, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace. And here's the thing, if you would like to make a difference in someone's life through, through your serving each week, just you can join our team, you can be part of our team, and it's really simple, you just text the word TEAM to 860-560-1950, and we will help you find a place where you can make a difference in people's lives every single week. So to prepare for the promise of the empty tomb, we often need to start with preparing practically in our church, but also by preparing internally in our hearts. In other words, you need to prepare not just practically, but spiritually, right? There is a battle that is going in the hearts and minds of every man, woman, and child in this planet. And the battle is between the flesh and the spirit. So we need to learn how to walk by the Spirit, no matter what is happening around us, and that's where it gets hard, right? So we do not give in to the flesh. So to prepare spiritually is that, is to learn to walk in the Spirit. It's, it's, and it all begins with being in a right relationship with God. God is relational. He created us for that. Genesis says that he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. But like we still do today, rather than trust God, rather than trusting God's definition of good and evil, Adam and Eve decide to define it for themselves. And it's their rebellion and ours that severs the relationship with God. And the Bible is the story of God's plan to reunite through his one and only son. So your spiritual preparation begins with trusting in Jesus. It begins in a relationship, trusting in his finished work on the cross. It's a humble thing, right? Because it's not anything I can do. It's what he's done. It's not on by my righteousness because I'm a good person. It's because what he did. But you know what? That's just the beginning. To prepare our hearts spiritually, we also need to be growing spiritually, right? That's how we can, we can receive the promise of the empty tomb, which is victory. How many of you guys like pizza? I'm hoping, I don't trust you if your hand is not up right now. <laughs> Just saying, okay. <laughs> uh, great pizza, how many knows a great pizza starts with a great dough, okay, with a great crust? All right, I'm Italian, so I'm an expert. I can, I can say this, no, I don't know, I'm not an expert. But it's that, that perfect texture, that perfect flavor, and think about it, the dough, it goes through a lot to become perfect, Right? It's slammed down on the counter, bam, right? It's, it's handled rough. A rolling pin flattens it out. I mean, it's spun in the air. I don't know. I see this on cartoons. Um, <laughs> but here's the thing. Most people are not thinking about the process of the, making the dough, right? They're just thinking about all the good stuff on top, mm -hmm. right? They're just thinking about the sauce and the cheese and the favorite toppings. You're like, Pastor, it's getting close to lunch. Can you stop doing that? <laughs> but it's the good stuff it, what happens sometimes is we're focused on that, but that good stuff won't happen unless the dough has been prepared to receive it. 
And you see, many people want to know why are they not seeing God's promises in their life? Because they're, they're wondering, why is it not happening the way they think? And God could be saying, you know what? The dough is not quite ready yet. So we need to be prepared. We need to prepare internally in our hearts to allow the pizza chef to do his work. Keep that as your word picture for this. The pastor said that God is a pizza chef. Anyways, don't tweet that. Um, the Bible word here is sanctification. Okay, that's, that's the Bible word, sanctification. But sometimes we treat the Bible like a rule book. And we treat Jesus just like a moral teacher. Jesus is a moral teacher, but he's not a mere moral teacher. And for Jesus to really make a, Jesus, a, a difference rather in your life, for true transformation, he needs to be way more than that. I'm going to share with you one of my favorite passages from C.S. Lewis. This is taken from Mere Christianity. I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing that we must not say. A man who is merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be either a lunatic on a level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else he is a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us and he did not intend to. Christianity is not just a philosophy of life. It's empowerment for living through a life-giving relationship with Jesus. Back to verse 13. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. So in all these physical preparations, they discovered spiritual realities. The lamb was the centerpiece of the Passover, and it was to be inspected by the temple authority to be found without spot or blemish. Now think about Jesus. The eyes of many were upon Jesus. And they found him without spot or blemish. And after his preparation, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. So the Passover lamb would remind them of God's deliverance from physical death. But Jesus, the soon-to-be lamb of God, would remind them of God's deliverance from spiritual death. Then there was the unleavened bread to remind them of the bread that they ate in haste when they escaped Egypt. Leaven in the Bible represents sin. So this took on a new profound truth. Think about it. When he takes the bread at the Last Supper, it took on the new meaning as a symbol of his broken body for our sins, right? And it's through repentance and trusting in his broken body that provides an escape from sin. And then there was three others that I mentioned. There was the bowl of salt water, which was to remind them of the tears shed in Egypt, the bitter herbs to remind them of the bitterness of slavery, and the paste that reminded them of the clay for which they had made bricks. You see, all three of these remind us of a life without Jesus, a life with tears, hopelessness, bondage, and they invite us to Jesus today where we can find true freedom. A few years ago at Easter, I did a series on the four cups of Passover. I don't know if any of you guys remember that. The four cups of Passover, we, only, we, don't, we don't hear all four in the Last Supper, but they always had uh, four. They, they uh, connect with the four I will promises in Exodus chapter 6. And we're going to read that, chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. Therefore, I will say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. First promise. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. And then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. There's four cups here. They're going to be up on your screen. Four cups correspond to the four promises that we just read. The first one is this, the cup of sanctification. The first cup at the Passover meal was a cup of sanctification. I will bring you out. To sanctify means to make separate. 
Jesus takes us out of the corruption of this world and he changes us from the inside out. The second cup is the cup of deliverance. I will deliver you. Jesus, he delivers his people from the power of sin. Cup number three, the cup of redemption. I will redeem you. To redeem means to buy something back. What did he do? We were bought with a price, right? By his shed blood, we were bought with a price. And I believe that this, is the, this third cup is the one where he said his famous line, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. Think about that. In my blood, which is poured out for you. The fourth cup is the cup of praise or joy. I will take you. I will take you to myself. This is the joy of the deliverance, the celebration. In fact, they would end the whole thing with singing a psalm, which is just what we see in the Gospels. In uh, Mark chapter 14, at the end of the Last Supper, it says this, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. If there's ever a reason to be joyful, if there's ever a reason to praise God, it's the unfathomable gift of his love, of his sacrificial death on the cross. And if we really want to understand and gain strength from what happened at Calvary, the Lord's table is the place to start. And we're going to be sharing communion this week, Good Friday. Uh, I invite you all to join us as we gather to remember what he did for us. So let's prepare for the promise of the empty tomb, number one, by preparing practically in the church, number two, by preparing internally our hearts, and number three, preparing externally in our world. Just like there's a spiritual battle going on here, we, know, we need to know there's a spiritual battle going on all around us, right? And to see that in our passage, we're going to back up to verse two. Look at what happened before the preparation. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. The problem the Jewish authorities had is they wanted to arrest Jesus but not provoke a riot. And the answer to their problem was the betrayal of Judas. Two things I notice here. God is always looking for people to be his instruments, but so is the enemy. We too can be servants of light or darkness. Secondly, Satan could not have entered Judas unless he had opened the door. William Barclay said it this way, there is no handle on the outside of the door of the human heart. It must be opened from within. Why did Judas betray Jesus? And there have been literally books written about this, but I think it goes back to his motivation for following Jesus in the first place. Because here's the thing, why do people join movements? They join movements because either they're deep conviction, they, they're, they're bought in by the mission, or maybe they're drawn in by contagious enthusiasm, or it's self-interest. For Judas, I believe it was self-interest that drove him to be part of the Jesus movement. You see, Judas was a political zealot, and as soon as he understood that Jesus was not going to meet his expectations as a political messiah, he turned on him. And the sobering caution for all of us today is this, be careful. Oh, be careful with unmet expectations because they can lead us or others to betrayal. So we need to be vigilant with our eyes wide open. First Peter chapter five, verse eight says, stay alert, watch for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls along around like a roaring lion. He isn't one like one looking for someone whom he can devour. I'm doing the King James there, sorry. Be prepared. The devil's not going to come at you in a red suit and pitchfork. It's not going to be like the 1980s plastic max, you know, Halloween costume, okay? The powers of this dark world come to you in unexpected ways. The Bible calls it an angel of light, right? Through someone or something that looks good. Amen. The words are right. Perhaps even the appearance is right. Amen. But it's a show. As 
we begin Holy Week, let's prepare for the promise of the empty tomb practically in his church, internally in our hearts and externally in this world, remembering that Jesus has already overcome the world. He already has won the victory. The promise of the empty tomb is the promise that other dead and ruined things in your life can come back to life. It's the promise of hope in the midst of hopelessness. It's the promise of a life-changing relationship with him. So don't take this journey to the empty tomb alone. Bring somebody with you. And that brings me to our call to action for today as we're wrapping up. Prepare for the empty tomb by inviting others to have an encounter with Jesus. Here's the thing. You will never meet eyes with someone who does not deeply matter to the heart of God. You may be the only Jesus that they ever see. My, my Easter message is called Encounter the Risen Jesus. So invite somebody to come. Our creative team has made it easy. If you look inside your worship guide, we have these Easter invites. If you don't have it, you can lift up your hands. Um, our uh, ushers can bring you some. Uh, but here's the thing. Don't stuff this in someone's windshield. Okay? All right, we're not, we're not offering 50% off on a, on, a, on a car wash. Okay? Let, let's make this relational, okay? Um, let's make it personal because here's the thing. I don't know if you guys know, but, but statistically, Easter is the, is the most likely time of year if you were to invite somebody to come to church for them to say yes. So don't miss the best opportunity all year that you have to, to reach your friend, your coworker, your classmate, your family member. Say, you know what? I'll pick you up on my motorcycle. Or I'll save you a seat. That might scare them away. Don't do that. Uh, I'll save you a seat or meet me early in the hub for coffee and we're going to walk in together. You could also send them a digital invite, which is located out at lifewaych.com forward slash Easter. So if you want to text somebody an invite or message them, that would be another way that you could do it. Imagine with me for a moment what would happen. What would happen if your friend, if your loved one, if your coworker, if your classmate had an encounter with the risen Jesus this Easter? Please bow your heads in prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I pray, oh God, wherever my words have failed, that you would speak. God, that your Holy Spirit would come in right now like a flood and that you would prepare us in every way, practically, spiritually, Show us the steps that we need to take to step into the promises that you have for us. I pray, oh God, for freedom from bondage in the name of Jesus. I pray for healing from brokenness. And I pray for new purpose in lives. Oh, whatever people are facing right now, that they would know that you are with them. And oh God, that, that you are going to move, Lord. You are on the move right now. And Lord, as we trust you to guide and empower us, in your name we pray. And as we keep praying today, I want to speak to those who feel far from God. You feel disconnected. You may be in the sanctuary. You may be joining us online, but you feel disconnected from God. I want you to know that's why Jesus came. He came. He's the one that lived the perfect life that you and I could not. And he became the perfect sacrifice on the cross for your sins and for mine. But remember, here's the thing. It was not enough for the lamb to be slain. The blood had to be applied to the doorpost. Likewise, you need to apply the blood of Jesus to your life. If that's you, if you need his forgiveness, if you're ready to say yes to Jesus, just pray with me now. Heavenly Father, I thank you, O oh God, for sending your son I turn from my way and I turn to you. I turn to follow Jesus. I cannot save myself. You are my savior and in faith I apply the blood to the door frame of my heart. And Jesus, I give you leadership in my life as Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that you fill me and empower me to fulfill the plans and purposes that you have for me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.